So, um, indeed, these are being videotaped. Um, I, I don't want to open up a, um, a sort of a blockbuster video or anything like that. If somebody misses a um, lecture or something like that, one isolated lecture, um, and you want to see a see one of the lectures, um, let me know and we can see what we can arrange. Okay. Que question: What? There, there will not be web audio at least for the moment. This will not be on the web, um, but but we'll we'll, we'll see. We're, we'll we'll see what we can work out. Um, any other questions about um, logistics or um, or uh, ac content material? The logistics should have been that the first homework was due today, uh, and um, again, when you turn it in, turn it in the back of the room, and um, we know we'll we'll look at it then. The second homework is coming out now. Okay, so you've got to worry about that. The other logistical thing to keep in mind is this Thursday there is no class. Okay, that um, this was as scheduled on the um, as scheduled because of the uh, NSF site visit has commandeered our classroom. So we will not have class on on um, Thursday, but we'll resume a week from now. Uh, any other logistical questions or anything like that? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, will you be posting fully worked out solutions to the homework problems anywhere? Um, full, will we be posting fully worked out solutions? The answer is not obvious, um, but we'll see. The more you nag me, the more likely it is to happen. Um, and we will we will work on we'll work on that and see what happens. I, part of me says that most of the solutions are in the um, are, are are in the textbook, um, but let me see what we can do. Don't me, and it's more likely to happen. Okay. Any other questions um, about logistics or technical material? Okay. So so far um, this semester, we've talked about uh, recurrences, relations, and summations, and that a lot of it you should have seen before. Um, what I'd like to now spend this week, or the next couple of lectures talking about, are um, some sort of, sort of working with floor and ceiling functions, okay? which are um, notation that you've probably seen and that you should be familiar with. But, um, but it tends to be a mathematical notation that's hard to work with unless you, 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 you're good at what you're doing. Okay? And so I'm going to spend a couple of lectures showing you what, to, um, what kind of things you can do with um, floor and ceiling functions, okay? if you know what you're doing. And there's really some amazing things you can do. Um, again, one summary of the scientific method I once read, which I liked, was that when you do a measurements, you do it with a micrometer to measure carefully. To draw, mark a line, you do it in chalk, okay? and then you cut it with an ax. Okay? Somehow denoting the idea of sort of losing precision in each step. Um, again, what, what floor and ceiling functions are, if you want to think of them, I like to think of them as sort of a mathematical axe that is a way to sort of convert integers, reals to integers. Okay? And despite the fact that they're sort of seemingly crude, you know, a, a crude thing to do to numbers, just to sort of chop off everything that's not an integer, in fact, you can prove some amazing things using floor and ceiling functions. And I hope we'll, hopefully we'll get into that today. So what do we mean by this, the floor function? The floor of x, okay, maybe I'll try to enlarge this. The floor of x is the greatest integer which is less than or equal to x. Okay? The ceiling of x, which may not show, uh, uh, hopefully shows up reasonably well, is denoted with the half brackets of x. The floor is the greatest integer less than or equal to x. Okay, the ceiling is the least integer greater than or equal to x. So if you want to think a little bit of what that actually means, okay, let's look at what happens when you have a, um, the, the, the red was the floor function. If you look at this timeline, or this number line, everything between 3 that's, that's, that's less than 3 and greater than or equal to 2, the floor of that kachung goes down to 2. Likewise, for the ceiling, the ceiling, if you want to think of it, works the other way. That anything that's greater than 1 and less, and less than or equal to 2, the ceiling of that is going to be 2. Okay? So one way to think of it, actually, is if you want to think of what the floor and ceiling functions are, you might want to think of these staircases. Okay? And notice that no um, discontinuities, no big discontinuities, 
happen when you get to negative numbers. Okay? So let's think about what that means. If you want to think of what these things mean, you go back to the definition. The floor is the greatest integer less than or equal to something. The ceiling is the least integer, no, the, the, the least integer greater than or equal to something. Okay? So what is, if we know e, the number e, 2.718, dot, 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 okay? The ceiling of e is going to be 3 because it's 2 rounds up, okay, because it's a fractional part. The floor of E is going to be 2, okay, because that rounds down, okay. Much more complicated, okay, or things that you have to make sure you get right are um, what about negative numbers, okay. What is minus E? The ceiling of minus E, okay. If you think about it, that's either going to be minus 2 or minus 3. That should be obvious, but which one is it? Well, by definition, the ceiling is the least integer greater than or equal to x. So what integer is greater than or equal to minus 2.78? Is minus 3 greater than or equal to okay, two, minus 2.78? And the answer is no. Okay. So the smallest integer that's greater than or equal to it, e is minus 2. All right. And likewise, the ceiling should give you the other one. It's the least integer. Um, it, it's the least integer greater than or equal to that. Okay. And so, let's just think about it. The least. Um, okay. So, so first, let's just make sure we agree, because I always get confused here. Minus two point eight. The ceiling was the least integer greater than that. That we agreed was minus two. The floor was the greatest integer less than or equal to that. The greatest integer less than or equal to that is minus 2.8, minus 2.7 is indeed minus 3. Okay? And so if you remember the definitions and you remember the shape of the functions, you should be able to keep straight what's happening with the negative numbers. Okay? Otherwise, you might be confused. Any questions about the floor and ceiling applied to negative numbers? Okay, good. Let's um look at an example of where floor and ceiling functions come up in an interesting way. Okay? Um, here is, actually let me focus on this thing a little bit. Um, zoom it in a little bit. Zoom. Okay. There was a following problem um, I, we worked on for a while that was kind of interesting. Suppose I give you an n by n lattice of integers, a grid of n points by n points. Okay? And I ask you, let's say we now want to talk about, if you have an n by n grid, how many pairs of points are there? OK, how many points are there in an n by n grid? n squared. OK, how many pairs of points are there in an n, in a, um, n by n grid? OK, well, basically, n squared choose 2, okay, because every pair of them defines a pair of points. Every pair of points will define a distance between them. Correct? The distance between here and here is an Euclidean distance. You can measure it, okay? It's this, presumably it's going to be the uh, square root of 3 squared plus 1 squared. Okay? It would be the length of that distance, okay? So one question that's a property of an n by n lattice, okay, is if you ask how lar often does the largest distance occur, okay? So let's take a look at this thing. If we look at a um, n by n lattice or n by n grid, what is the largest, what pair of points defines the largest distance in the lattice? Okay, this should be pretty obvious. Which one is it? The upper and lower diagonals. Okay, so lo and behold, the largest distance occurs twice. Okay, and notice that that's true for, no matter if you have n is 100, 1,000, a million. Okay, the, large, the largest distance occurs twice. Okay. How often, what is the second largest distance in an um, integer lattice? Let's take a look at this in this integer grid. What pair of points defines the second largest distance? Okay, if we talk about Euclidean distances. Okay, does anyone want to venture a guess? Okay, which pair of points, let's say, might describe the second largest distance? So you, okay, one possibility would be to say between here and here, in fact, this, I claim, is clearly going to be bigger than that. Okay? 
So the second largest distance occurs, I claim, in an integer lattice is actually going to be you move in one point on one side. Uh, and this is going to be the second largest distance. Okay, and I think you could pretty much convince yourself of that. How many times does that distance occur in a integer in an n by n integer lattice? Okay. Eight. Why is it eight? Well, if we have this here, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven, eight. Okay. It's harder actually to do that in a tele looking at yourself in a television screen because it's reversed and you don't know where your fingers are. Okay. So I claim that it's pretty clear that the second largest distance occurs two to eight times. What's the third largest distance? Okay. This is something you have to actually, may, maybe you wouldn't believe me as much. Okay. I claim that, in fact, the third largest distance in, an, in this lattice is, in fact, defined over here. It could be, I mean, the other candidate might be this. But this would be, um, well, you know, you do your, 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 um, your trigonometry and that you should be pretty, you know, if you remember Pythagoras' theorem, you should be able to convince yourself of that. How often does this distance occur? Let's stop and think about it. Okay, how often does it occur? Okay. From this point, it should occur one, two, three. Okay. Wait, one, two, three times. Okay. Um, on each one of the four sides. Actually, um, although actually it should also occur down like this. Okay, so this should also be one, two, three. Okay, so let's actually think about how many times it actually does count. Remember, you have to be careful you don't double count something that's happening there. My claim is that if you count that carefully, it comes up twelve times. Okay, and um, I, uh, I I believe that. Okay, I don't know if I uh, should, should we try to convince ourselves of that. Let's do that because it's, I'm not completely sure it's working out just yet. Okay, one, two, three times. Four, five, six times. Um. Um, and then I think it's two other times this way. One, two. And so, let me just think about this. Okay, How many, are people convinced that it's twelve? Okay, as opposed to sixteen. Okay, good. Okay. So I claim, if we do it, work this out for a sufficiently large lattice, okay, that, that I claim that the n largest distance, the n minus one largest distances in an integer lattice, it's n by n, is the same regardless of how big the lattice is. Okay, you should, we've got a sequence here that is infinitely long that says that for, in an in, for a sufficiently large, for a sufficiently large n, how long does that, how often does that sequence come in? Okay, does that distance, does the ith largest distance occur? Okay, and I claim it's an integer sequence like this. All right, what should you do if you have an integer sequence? Okay, does anybody remember what the best thing to do when you've got an integer sequence and you want to figure out what it is? One thing is you plug it into the Sloan's handbook, okay, and see if it comes up. And in fact, this one won't come up. Okay, the second thing is you think about it and you try to see can you see a pattern or whatnot. Can anybody look at this thing and see what that sequence is? What the value of the i, th this value of count sub i is, for value i. Okay, can anybody see a simple pattern, a simple equation that give, governs this? Okay. Well, it turns out the simple equation is this one. Okay. And uh, you may say, oh, that's not fair. Okay, it's not so simple. Okay. But what was interesting was that, um, again, uh, for another one of the good graduate projects from several years ago, okay, a student, Venegop, already proved that for all values of i, the frequency of the i largest distance for i less than n is 2 times i if i is a perfect square. Okay? So if we think about what are the perfect squares, well, 1 is a perfect square, 4 is a perfect square, um, you know, sort of what's the next perfect square? Uh, 9, okay, is a perfect square. Okay, so 2 times that. Um, then, otherwise, it was this ugly thing with floors and ceilings. Okay? How would you derive such a, func such a, such a complicated looking expression? 
And my claim is that by, you know, it looks like a horribly ghastly, but in fact, this is not such an unbelievably difficult thing to derive. Okay, and again, it was done as a broad graduate project, again, a good graduate project. Okay, and shows that if you know how to manipulate these things carefully, you can, you know, indeed do something with expressions like this. Okay, any questions of what this formula is or why it arises? Again, this is mostly for motivation, okay, than, than anything else. I got a question, how many people over the weekend did try to play with Sloan's handbook on, on the web? Were there a bunch of people who played with it? Looks like we had about four or five people who played with it. I encourage the rest of you to sort of pick your favorite sequence and go to the website and play around with it. Because it's an, it's, it's an interesting thing to play around with, okay? And, you know, you may be kind of impressed. Okay, fair enough. But let's now, so now I think we see that um, working on, um, working with floors and ceilings, okay, is a, um, you know, you can do something with it if you know what you're, you're doing. Okay, let's look now at um, certain properties. First claim is that the floor of X is the ceiling of X. The floor of X is equal to the ceiling of X for all values X that are not integers. Okay, I'll, I'll take it back. No, take it back. Well, it's the exact opposite, okay? That the floor of X is equal to the ceiling of X if and only if X is, is an integer. Otherwise, the two numbers will differ by one. Okay? That everybody should believe, right? Because if it's... If x is an integer, if it's a floor of 3 is 3, the ceiling of 3 is 3. Otherwise, one goes up, one goes down. Okay? Another way to write that same property is to say that the ceiling of x minus the floor of x is equal to the Iversonian term, x is not an integer. Okay? If x is an integer, okay, this is false, meaning it's 0. And this is going to be 0. Otherwise, this is going to be 1, and that's going to be 1. Okay? So this is, again, one place where we can start to sort of see where the Iversonian notation might be interesting to reason about. The other thing is to note certain inequalities that exist. First claim is, that's sort of interesting to note, is that the floor of x is strictly greater than x minus 1. Okay? Notice that what happens when you take the floor of x, okay? If x is an integer, okay, it does nothing to it, okay? If it's less than some integer, if it's 2.99999, it chops off the point 0.9999, okay? So there is no question, so, so, so the floor may lower it, but it lowers it by a number strictly less than 1, okay? So this is sort of an important inequality to see. Okay, it may be obvious, okay, but again, I find it's necessary to go through these things carefully. Okay, likewise, on the other side, we know that the ceiling of x is going to, the ceiling will raise it, but it can never raise it by 1, because if it's an integer, it's leaving it where it is. Okay, otherwise, it'll raise it by a little bit less than that. And, of course, the thing in the middle, the floor, of the, the, the ceiling is obviously greater than or equal to it, the x is greater than or equal to the floor. Equality, of course, holding it integers. Any questions about that? That everybody should believe. Let's look at the, the other, another interesting set of identities that is somehow useful to deal with sometimes is that the floor of minus x is equal to minus the ceiling of x. Okay? Let's try to convince ourselves of this with an example. Okay? What happens if we have minus 2.5? What is the floor of minus 2.5? The floor is going to be, we want to lower it. That means that it's going to go down to minus 3. Likewise, 2.5 minus 2.5, okay, raising that, the ceiling of that's going to be 3 minus 3. So this should clearly be seen to be true. And likewise, the reverse side is also going to be obvious. Okay, again, that, uh, again, you can, I, the way I find it easiest to work with these things is to convince yourself of it, try two values, one of which is two and a half and one of which is two, and convince yourself that both of them behave as properly. Okay, so in fact, we can convert, if we have negative numbers, we can often convert them to positive numbers by switching ceilings and floors. Okay? Another thing that's useful to think about is suppose let's say we want to take the floor 
or equivalently the ceiling of x plus n, where n is an integer. Okay? What's interesting is we can, we can remove, simplify out by pulling out any integer. So x, the, the floor of x plus n is the floor of x plus n, okay, when n is an integer. Okay? And that's sort of a useful way. It's a way to simplify out what's inside the floor. Another useful piece of notation, which we're going to see, is to talk about the fractional part of a number. The floor and ceiling give us a way to chop thing into an integer. When we talk about something that's in squiggly brackets of x, that's what we're going to determine called the fractional part okay, of x, meaning what gets chopped off by the floor. So my claim is that the, the fractional part of x is equal to x minus the floor of x. Okay? And this is a useful piece of notation because when you're trying to simplify or work with floors, okay, it's sometimes useful to sort of explicitly break it down and see what you can deal with the fractional part. We'll see an example of that later on. Any question? Question. question. Yeah, question. What if that was the floor of x plus y, where y is, a, let's say, floating point like x, is that equal to the floor of x plus the floor of y? OK, let's think about it. It's a good question. Let's now figure that out. OK? The question is, suppose we have the floor of, actually, let me try a better marker. We have the floor of x plus y. Is this equal to the floor of x plus the floor of y? OK? Let's think about that, OK? I claim it's not equal to that. Now, why is it? Well, let's, first of all, the easiest way to prove it is to come up with an example. Can we come up with examples of x and y where that's not true? 2.7 plus 3.8, OK? Well, what's going to happen here? The point is here, the fractional parts add up to be enough that they um, sort of round up to another integer. And so here you chop off the, the fractional parts. Here you don't. Okay, Here the fractional parts have accumulated. So this is one of the things that makes working with floors and ceilings hard, is you can't simply break things apart, Okay, remove the, the things out. Only you can pull out anything that is an um, integer. But if it's a real part, that's bad. What you could do to write this, which would be a, a true thing, you could write this thing as this plus the fractional part of x plus y. Actually, uh, let's just think how we could write this thing. I think if we did this. Actually, let's, um, no, the floor of this, excuse me. Do we believe that? Yes, I think we believe this, OK? That, in fact, we could represent this thing as being the floor of x plus the floor of y plus the floor of the sum of the fractional parts. Okay. Actually, um, that's really what we have. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's rewrite that since it doesn't look at like good. That actually would be true. Okay. So add this to that. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So this is an important truth to verify when you're working on um, with fractional things, with, with floors and ceilings. OK? So what do we actually get? Well, certain. how do we now work with sums of things with fractional parts, with floors and ceilings? Certain sums, I claim, will become easier, actually, to work with when you have, fractional, when you have floor and ceiling functions. What is the sum as i goes from 1 to infinite, infinity of 1 over i cubed plus 49i squared plus, plus 49i squared? If we don't have the um, brackets, okay, it gets to be sort of a more complicated thing. With the brackets, I claim it's very easily shown to be 0. Why? Every single term for all i greater than or equal to 1, for i equals 1, this is going to be 1 plus 49, 1 over 50. Okay? And it's only going to keep getting smaller and smaller for larger values of i. Thus, the floor of this thing, okay, each term goes to um, 0. And so the sum of all 0 terms is 0. That's easy. Likewise, if we took the ceiling of this, okay, 
All of these terms are going to be between 0 and 1. The ceiling of each one of them is going to be 1. Okay, the sum of that is going to be an, is going to diverge. It's going to be an infinite term. However, most of the time, working with um, summations with ceilings and floors is going to be more complicated than what we did before because of the thing that was just observed, okay? That the fractional parts, you have to add up for them. Basically, what the problem is, is that you can't fra factor something out of an equation, okay? The floor of n times x, okay? is not the same as n times the floor of x, even if n is an integer. Why is that? OK? Because you can think of x as being the, the floor of x plus the fractional part of x. n times the fl floor of x is an integer, and that's fine. The trouble is you've got this fractional part times n. How many of them end up surviving the um, you know, the, the, the ceiling is sort of a more, the floor is a more complicated business. Okay, so you cannot simply pull things out of a, 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 a floor function. Instead, if you want to work with floor and ceiling functions, the right way to work with them is to think of these things as inequalities, okay, and then manipulate them like that. So what does that mean? If you want to say that the floor of x is equal to some integer n, I claim that you can think about that as saying, this is equivalent to saying that x is greater than or equal to n, okay? Certainly the floor of x is by definition, if, if the floor of x is n, then it could be equal to n or it could be a little bit greater than n, okay? So I claim that what this says is basically that the th thing that the floor of x is equal to n is equivalent to saying that x lies between n tight and is strictly less than n plus 1. And likewise, the ceiling of x equal to n, that means that um, x has the property that it is less than n, okay, is less than or equal to n, because if x was equal to n, then um, that would be acceptable. If not, x has to be less than n. Okay, because we're raising it up in order to make it equal. Okay, and so I claim that in fact x has to lie tight between n minus one. Between x is greater than n minus one and less than n. Okay, so these are equivalent statements. Okay, and so one way to think about working, you're working it with ceilings and floors in in expressions, is to think about rewriting these kind of terms as Iversonians and manipulating them carefully. Any questions about these? Okay. Again, let's just sort of go back this way. The, when you say that the floor of x equals n, um, here we had it written with um, x between n. We could also write it as n between x. We know that here, if the floor of x is equal to n, does this mean that x is bigger than? or less than n. Let's think about what this means. Okay? If we say that the floor of x is equal to n, what do we know about x? Is x potentially bigger than n? Yes. Is x potentially less than n? No. Is x potentially equal to n? Yes. Okay? So that's really what we say, that x is equal to n, okay, but n is greater than x minus 1. Okay? And likewise, if we want to over here, if we say that x is equal to the ceiling of x, what do we know about x? If x is the ceiling of x, is x bigger than or less than n? What does that, how do we read that? Okay, is x bigger than n? Okay, well let's think what that means. If the ceiling of x is n, that means that if we raise x up, if we make x bigger than n, okay, make x bigger than, than it was, it's then equal to n. If you're smaller than me, okay, if, 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 if I have to do something to put you, if I have to put you in high heel shoes so that we're the same height, are you bigger than me or less than me? Okay, that's the situation here, okay? The ceiling of x means that we have to put it in high heel shoes to make it equal to n, okay? That means that x is, that n is greater than or equal to x, okay? It could be equal, okay? 
could be very, if it's equal, you use very thin shoes. All right. Any questions about that? Okay. Again, to play around with these things, you have to sort of work with it and think about it and get, select, you know, and, and play with it a while until you feel comfortable working with these. Okay. Because it's a little bit counterintuitive and it's a little bit um, delicate. Any questions? Okay, under certain circumstances, we can dispense with floors and ceilings, okay? So for example, if we have an expression like this, the ceiling of the floor of x, I claim that that's equal to the floor of x. Why is that the same? Because again, when you evaluate anything, you evaluate it from inside out, okay? The floor of x is already an integer. The ceiling or floor of an integer is that integer. So once, you, once, you've, once you've integerized it, everything else gets sort of redundant. Okay? So, and this is sort of a good thing to know, because when you're working with a complicated sum or, or expression here, your goal is to try to drop as many layers of nesting as possible. Okay? And that's really what we're saying here. Okay, What other identities do we have? My claim is if we have an integer n and real x, Saying that x is less than n is the same as saying, okay, is equivalent to saying the floor of x is less than n. Why is that? Convince yourself of it. Certainly if you have a real x less than n, taking the floor of it only chops that thing down some more, right? So it's certainly clear the expression goes that way. What about the other way? Okay? Why is it clear that if x that the floor of x less than n implies that x is less than n. Well, the secret is that n is an integer. Okay, because n is an integer, the only way to change the the the, the, the sign of whether you know, the the truth or falsity the change this inequality is if we happen to change if the, if the act of taking the floor happens to drive it below that integer, but it never will. Okay. So it's easy to see it works that way. It's important to see that it also works that way. How many people see that this expression works that way? Raise your hands if you do. And how many people are confused if you don't? OK, or don't believe that it does? OK, and so everybody here is basically content. Likewise, in a similar sense, the claim is that if x is greater than some integer, the ceiling is greater than that integer, certainly that implies. But the other way works the same way. That if, in fact, we know that if we raise it, we have a real number, and we raise it to, um, and then we raise it to the next integer, it's greater than this integer. That meant it had to be greater than that integer before. Okay, and that's why it works the other way. Okay? Likewise, when we have greater than or equal notations, again, here when we have something, here, here the interesting case is suppose we have that. Um, if the um, ceiling of x is less than or equal to n, clearly that implies that x is less than or equal to n. This way it's easy. The other way, let's see why that actually is. Okay, If we have that um, x is less than or equal to n, okay, raising it, taking the ceiling will raise it. That will not change things at all if x was an integer. If it was an integer, the only thing that may happen is it might create equality where there wasn't equality before. Okay, So that also works both ways. And I think you can figure out for yourself the last expression. Okay, Again, I urge you to go through these. Some of these may seem very, very obvious or simple or, or boring. Okay, But I urge you to go through them and work out with these equalities to get comfortable with them. Because the secret to successfully working with ceilings and floors is trading, um, basically trying to get, get rid of these ceiling and floors, relaxing them by, by working on these inequalities, okay, until you've simplified it as far as you can. Then, once you're there, often what the best thing to do is to um, do some sort of kind of analysis on what's left. Are the, you know, can you break it into two cases if it's even or odd, or negative or positive, or things like that? Okay. Any questions? Good. Well, let's look at a, a not so trivial example.
Suppose we want to prove that the, the floor of the square root of the floor of x is the same as the floor of the square root of x. Okay? Namely, that the square root, uh, that, 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 that this inner floor is redundant for all real x greater than 0. Okay? This is the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, some, I, I don't know how many people look at this thing and say, yeah, sure. Okay? But I don't. Okay, I mean this is sort of, you know, this is a delicate process. So how could we prove such, a, such an identity? First let's rename things a little bit. Let's say that m is equal to the thing on this side. That m is equal to the floor of the square root of the floor of x. Okay? By definition, this means that m is an integer. Okay? So now, how can we rewrite this? When we have an expression like m equals um, the floor of x, or m equals that, I claim that using our, going back to um, one of our previous slides, let's just take a look at this thing. If we look at our um, identities here, this says that when we say that um, an integer is equal to the floor of something, Okay, we can express it either in terms of as inequalities, either with what's inside bounded by integers, or the integer bounded by what's inside. Okay? Here we use what's inside bounded by integers. Okay? And if you believe the, um, again, maybe it pays to double check this thing. My claim is that m, if, if m is equal to the floor of that thing, that means m is less than or equal to the thing without it. And also, this is strictly less than m plus 1. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. Now let's look at that. How can we get rid of the square root? Okay, which is sort of an ugly thing. Well, suppose we square both sides. Okay, or all sides. Okay. The inequalities are still going to hold because we're insisting that x and whatnot is all greater than 0. So you don't have to worry about signs flipping, which might be a case when you talk about squaring. Okay. So now we know that m squared okay, is less than or equal to the floor of x, okay, and that um, floor of x is strictly less than m plus 1. Now I claim, using what we showed before, we can establish that the um, floor inside here is redundant. Why is that? Let's be careful. If we know um, the floor of x is greater than um, m squared. Clearly, x is greater than m squared, right? That I think people believe pretty freely. I freely believe that freely, okay? What about this side here? Suppose we know that the floor of x is less than m squared, uh, m plus 1 squared. Dropping the floor is a dangerous thing. Because the floor, because the floor will make, may have made it smaller, okay? But we do know that this was an integer, okay? And so I claim that if this thing was an integer, okay, if x was, if x was an integer, okay, that, and this was true, then it certainly, whether you have the floor or not, it's identical. If x was not an integer and this was true, it may have been 2.999, if 2.99 was less than 3, then 2 is less than 3. Okay? And so I think it should be clear that, in fact, here, this is now redundant. Okay? How many people think they get that? Looking around. Most people. How many people are confused? Okay? Or any questions is probably a better way to say that. Any questions? Okay? So now we can take the square root of everything, and now we can start to get things back. Okay? Now we know that m is less than or equal to the square root of x. This is less than or equal to that. Because our identities were um, if and only if, if, somehow we could rewrite something as the floor of something in terms of identities, these things go back and forth. If m an integer is, if, if um, an integer is less than x, okay, and the next highest integer is greater than it, then darn it, m is the greatest integer less than that, or the floor. Okay? 
So if you want, we can reason about how we got this expression again. Okay? Now we know that m is equal to that. Since m was equal to that, this is equal to that. And we've succeeded in dropping the um, floor. Any questions about the steps here? Okay? Again, if you're careful and diligent, you can do these kind of things. One counting problem, which comes up a lot, okay, in terms of, um, you know, let's say, let's say combin combinatorial problems and just, you know, actually this is the kind of thing that comes up in programming all the time, okay, to talk about what the difference is between open and closed intervals and how many integers are actually in them. If we talk about a line, any two numbers, real numbers, alpha and beta on a line, where alpha is less than beta, define an interval. We talk about intervals as being open or closed, depending upon whether or not they contain their endpoints. So an interval is open if it does not contain the endpoints of that interval. Closed if they do. Okay, so closed if they do include the endpoints. Okay, and half open if they include one of them. The notation that we usually use is that open stands for, um, is sort of the parentheses, while the closed is sort of the bracket, the hard bracket, okay? If you want to think of that as well, closed sort of, this is harder and closed is harder, open is soft, and uh, parentheses are curved and soft. You can think of that if you want, okay? But a way to think about what this interval means is that we have the interval, open x, open alpha, closed beta, that describes all x such that x is greater than beta and less than, x is greater than alpha and less than or equal to beta. Okay? That's basically just the definitions that we have here. One useful property of, half, of open intervals or half open intervals is that you can sort of add them and cover intervals. Okay? If you take the, the union of the half open interval, open alpha, closed beta, open beta, closed gamma. This is the half open interval from open alpha to closed gamma. Why? Because if you think about it, every single point is counted exactly once. Okay? If you, you know, that, that somehow the point beta is in this side, but not in that side. Okay? And everything that's greater than beta is on that side. Everything less than beta is on that side. If, in fact, these were two closed intervals, you'd be double counting that point P, that point B, okay? And that's just sort of, so when you're being precise about things, you've got to be careful about that. Fairly often, the, again, in generally in dealing with intervals, I, I find that we're, we're, the, the thing that I most often need to do with them is to count them, how many things um, lie within an interval. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of biographies, okay? And I saw that someone was born in, 19, you know, in, in 1843. It, Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809 and died in 19, 1865. How many years did Abraham Lincoln live? Okay. Well, the truth, of course, is that um, in there, again, that's sort of a, you, you really want to know is how many years are there between that. Okay. And part of the trickiness with years is, of course, that the question of do you credit somebody with a full year? for sort of if they were the number of years they were lived in, okay? So and somehow if somebody was born, lived for one day from, um, you know, from December 31st to January 1st, do you credit them with one year or two years or no years? Okay, that's sort of the tricky business here, okay? So in situations, you often need to count how many integers lie in an interval, okay? And the question of whether these, you're talking about open intervals or closed intervals, or again, the complexity of... Um, you know, of, um, you know, years is, is, I guess the issue with years is presumably that in a birth year, a death year, that doesn't give you enough information. You also need to know months and days, okay? But nonetheless, I claim we need to count intervals from time to time. The following identities are important to sort of know or sort of believe, okay? If you have integers, if, if alpha and beta are integers, how many integers are contained within the interval from exactly alpha to beta? Okay, if it's open, if it's closed, that means we include the intervals. 
Okay? How many are there? Again, I always have a hard time doing this. So the way I do it is I sort of count. Okay? If alpha was equal to beta, okay, then beta minus alpha is 0. But there's still one integer there, right? So it's got to be beta minus alpha plus 1. Okay? If we have the soft interval, okay, open on both A and B, where A and B are integers, I claim it's the same thing as before except two less, because you subtracted out um, that integer and that integer. Okay? So what is this going to be? Of course, now here you've got a little bit of a tricky thing. What if alpha equals beta? Okay? Then that says that you've got, um, what you call it? Minus 1, okay, so that's a bad thing, okay? So, um, so maybe we should say distinct integers is probably a good word here. Okay? In general, if you have a half open or half closed interval, the way I think about it is you've cut off one of these integers from before, okay? And so you would have beta minus alpha integers, okay? Let's see if we believe this. The, 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 everything was based basically on this. Let's make sure we believe it for different ones. If this is 2 and this is 1, that has 2. 2 minus 1 is 1, plus 1 is 2. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Do we believe that the soft open, here we have the open interval from um, 1 to 2. If both sides are open, it should contain 0. That actually is then 2 minus 1 plus 1. Yeah, that I believe. Okay, so these now I think we believe provided they're distinct integers. More complicated is the case where you want to count how many integers there are in um, an interval um, you know, where alpha and beta are no longer constrained to be integers. The way I think about this problem is I think about, um, again, do the following identities work? Let's sort of go through and verify them. Okay? I usually think about trying to prove it by um, going back to the uh, case on the line. Okay? Suppose, let's say, I want to count how many integers there are in um, the, 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 the card integer interval between B, between, um, B minus A. Okay, I would claim that the number of integers in this interval is exactly the same as the number of integers that one gets. Okay, actually, this is a um, let's just think about how they're they're doing this thing. Is is the same as a number of integers that lie within here and here? Correct. If you want to think of how many integers lie between a and b. Okay, if we were to raise a to the next integer and lower b to the next highest integer that is exactly what's described over here okay and that reduces to the special case that we have here so the floor of b round snaps it down the ceiling of a snaps it up and then we have the same situation as before likewise um, if we consider the um, uh, this sort of by analogy with um, the case of the two open intervals. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's just go through these cases just to make sure we verify it. Because again, I find that I have to go through these to believe them. What if we now have the, um, seal it, the, the, the open interval with b? That means it doesn't contain b if b is an integer. Okay, okay, let's, just, let's just think about this. Oh, okay. Here's, in fact, actually this case here where we have the. Uh, Ceiling of um, the, the open interval from, um, from the half open interval with alpha include, a, with hard on, on alpha, open on beta. How many integers are included? Well, if we snap this up and snap this up, okay, it is one less than what it would have been, okay, if this was a hard interval, okay? It's okay, I'm, I'm actually fumfering here, okay? Let's go through and try to convince ourselves of this, okay? But again, it's very, very easy to write these expressions, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's now try to convince ourselves. 
How many integers are there in the um, open interval from B, from A alpha? By analogy with the previous one, which we believed, we raised that up. The only difference between the previous thing is that we took the floor if it were, instead of the ceiling, and we subtracted 1. So let's look at what the difference is between the open and the closed integer interval. Suppose b is an integer, OK? If b is an integer, OK, this and this are the same. And the only difference between this and that is that we chop off one point. So yes, I believe that for the case of b being an integer. If b is not an integer, OK, what this is saying is let's round it up and not include that point anyway. OK, and that again is analogous to what we've got here. OK, so thinking of it that way, I do believe this half open interval. OK, any questions? I realize I fumpered through that perhaps more than I should. But again, I urge you to go through these things and work with them and, and convince yourself of them before you go too far into the picture. Any questions? Okay. Why are these kind of formulas useful? Well, let's look at a problem like the following. How many integers from 1 to n, including from n goes from 1 to 1,000, satisfy the property that the floor of the cube root of n divides n? What does divides mean? That means that, that, that this divided by that is, is an, you know, leaves an integer. Okay? That this, that this is a, a factor of n. Okay? If I were asked to solve this problem, I would probably sit down and write out a uh, program, to be honest with you. would be my first way to try to do it, because it's only counting up to 1,000. Okay? But in general, let's look at how you would, would, would try to um, compute such a thing. One idea is to sum. For all uh, n, as it goes from 1 to 1,000, the Iversonian terms, cube root of n, okay, divides n. This is going to be 1 if that's true. It's going to be 0 if it's not true. Okay? This is going to work, um, you know, basically count the number of integers that have that property. Okay? Any questions? That should be, should be obvious. When you have this um, floor, let's substitute something equal to it. Say k equals that. So now let's sum up over all k and n with the property that k is equal to the cube floor of that. If k is that and k divides n and n is between 1 and 1,000, let's give ourselves a point for it. Otherwise, let's not. Okay. This should be, these two terms are identical. These two expressions are clearly identical. Now what becomes useful, interesting, well, what's hard to work with? It's hard to work with the floor and ceiling. And so we can replace that by an inequality. And there's probably two different ways to do it. Okay. Um, here we say that n is going to lie between k, you know, that, that, that this is the same as ba saying basically that um, Basically, what we did here was show that uh, the thing inside related to k. Then we cubed both sides to get rid of the, the cube root. We got that inequality. To get rid of this, let's have another variable that says that n is equal to k times m. And that's a useful trick to get rid of the divide sign. Because okay? this is going to be 1 if and only for, only for all pairs of integers such that n is equal to km. Okay? If n, k divides m. That means that k divides n, that means there's some integer m such that n is equal to k times m. There's only one such integer, so we're in no danger of overcounting. Okay, and this goes back like that. Any Okay. Now what can we do? Well, here there's two different moves that we're taking a look at. The first that claims is to um, the, that, 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 that we're going to get rid of what n is. How do we get rid of n? Well, if n is equal to km, we can simply replace n by km whenever we see it. And now we've got the number of variables down. Okay. 
Second thing that was done here is to notice that we've got something that goes from 1 to 1,000, okay? And we're saying basically that n lies between 1 and 1,000, okay? This is the floor of the cube root of n. What are the values that k can take on? What is the smallest value that k can take on if k is equal to the floor of the cube root of n? Okay. Well, the smallest value n can take on is 1. The cube root of 1 is 1. Floor of that is 1. So k can be 1. What is the largest value that k can take on? Okay, here we have 1,000. It can take on the value of 10. What is, it's going to be, so, so k is going to be 10 for 1,000. What is it going to be for 999? Okay, what is the floor of the cube root of 999? 9. So what's interesting here, if you look at this thing, you can break this up as follows. In some sense, we're counting full regions. Okay, all the values of the cube roots. If you think about what's actually happening here, all values of n whose floor of cube root is going to be 9 is counted by this interval. But only one value of n, whose cube root is 10, is being counted. So by pulling that out, treating that special case as saying, well, well does, does the cube root of 1,000, which is the floor of the cube root of 1,000, which is 10, divide 1,000? Yes, it does. We've now taken care of all the 10s. And now we know that k is, is, is it's 1 plus this. But now we've got full intervals. Okay, and that's potentially a useful thing. How many people see the trick that's going on? How many people don't see it? Okay, this is a little bit clever in how you're doing it. Okay, to sort of be looking ahead and saying that, well, let's get rid of the special case, okay, and then just deal with full intervals. Now we've got an expression that looks like this. Okay, well, what does this now mean? Okay, you've got Km is between K and K squared. Km is between K and K plus 1 squared. One thing that we could do is divide all sides by K. That means that K is going to be between M. Okay, that, that, that once we divide this thing, this is going to be true for all M, which is greater than or equal to N squared, K squared. And all m that is less than k plus 1 cubed over k. Here we're looking to really count the number of times, that, the number of m for which this thing is actually true. I claim that we can reduce the count of how many this is true for a given k to count how many integers there are in the interval from k, k squared to k plus 1 cubed. Okay. Why is this? This is going to be true for all values. You want to know which values of m. We're counting the numbers of m for which this thing is true. This, I claim, reduces to counting how many integers there are that m that will satisfy this interval. And that means counting all integers such that, that it's between k squared inclusive and k plus 1 cubed over k, not inclusive. Okay, This is a half-open interval. Using the formula we have, we can look up. We can count how many integers there are here. Thus, for any given k, the number of times this is going to be true is going to be the number of m for which this is true. This is the result we get from that. Now we're basically summing up as k goes from 1 to 10, not counting 10, these terms, the interesting thing here is k squared is an integer, 3k is an integer, 3 is an integer, k squared is an integer. On all of those, we can pull them out of the floor, or something, because they are integers. The only thing we have left is the ceiling of 1 over k, what is the ceiling of 1 over k for all k greater than or equal to 1? Okay, well, it's going to be something greater than 0. 
and less than 1, less than or equal to 1, so this automatically becomes 1. What survives, this cancels that, 3k, 3 plus 1, 4. And our expression simply reduces to this, okay? 1 plus the sum of this, which is a trivial sum to do, okay? Any questions about it, okay? It's easy to get lost in the algebra, and it's easy, but, but I urge you to go back, convince yourself that this is true, okay? And see how, again, we, we relaxed things, we converted things into interval testing, okay? We had extra variables. We were converted things from floors into inequalities and massaged on it there. Any questions? Okay. These things so far, maybe it hasn't been that interesting. I'd like to now show you something that I consider to be one of the most amazing theorems in mathematics that I've ever seen, okay, to be honest with you, okay? And um, this has to do with a mathematical construct uh, called the BD sequence, okay? What is a BD sequence? A BD sequence, okay, is defined by given real number alpha, and it's simply the sequence of numbers that you get by the floor of alpha times i for all i greater than starting from 1 and going on to infinite, infinity, okay? If you think about what that sequence of numbers is, okay, what is the sequence of numbers, okay, generated by, let's say, the BD sequence of pi, okay? Pi is 3.14159265353 dot, 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 okay? So it's roughly 3 plus a seventh, if you want to think of it like that. So the BD sequence of that is going to be 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, oops, every seventh term, let's say, roughly, it will jump by an extra one because of the accumulated fractional parts. Does everybody believe on that? Okay, and again, it'll go up by 3, 3, you know, it'll now go up by about 3, 3, 3. 3, 3, and then maybe every 7th term or 6th term or 8th term, it'll jump up again, okay? So you're going to have a sequence that's going to grow roughly linearly, okay? But um, skip every once in a while, or jump, okay, when the fractional parts add up to something. Agreed, right? Okay? Here is the BD sequence for um, pi, 3, 6, 9, dot, dot, dot. Here is the BD sequence of pi over pi minus 1. That's 3.14 divided by 2.14. That's a little bit greater than 1, right? How much is it greater? About 1 and a half, I'm going to guess. Wait. Um, 3.14 over 2, 3.14 over 2.14. What is that? Does somebody with a calculator have, tell me what that actually is? 2 point, um, okay, I'll give this a second. So one, one, something greater than one, okay? If you look at that, we have a BD sequence that, again, skips. It looks like, um, does anybody have an answer yet for pi over pi minus one? What is that? So, 1.47 something. Okay, it's 1.47 dot, 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 okay? And uh, again, roughly, that means every other term it's going to skip, right? One, two, skip, four, five, six, skip, seven, eight, skip, okay? In a regular pattern of skips. Does anybody notice anything interesting about the sequences for, for pi and pi over pi minus one? Okay, is there anything interesting about those set of sequences that one can observe? Okay, does anyone see any, anything interesting? They're complements. Every integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 7, 18, 19, uh, 18, 19 is over here. Okay. It looks like every integer is in exactly one of those sequences. Okay. And in fact, if you do this for other irrational numbers, e, 2.718, Square root of 2, these are everybody's favorite irrational numbers. Lo and behold, each one of these partitions the integers into two different 
you know, partitions the integers perfectly between them. Okay? Now, this is sort of an amazing thing, and, and certainly it would not be true if you didn't have an irrational number. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, for any rational, um, what do you call it? For any rational um, value, uh, 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 rational number alpha, skip pattern is going to re this skip pattern is eventually going to repeat. That you're going to sort of have a, a period after which sort of um, pi times i, and your, your, your uh, phi, alpha times i is in fact exactly equal to an integer. Okay, and then it's simply going to repeat. But for an irrational number. Because you have a, um, ir ir an irrational number, these patterns are going to go, and there's not going to be any pattern to the skips. It's simply going to go arbitrarily at some random points. Numbers are going to be, jumps are going to occur in one sequence, jumps are going to occur in the other sequence. There's no finite pattern of where these jumps are going to sort of start repeating. That's because they're irrational. The amazing thing is, and this I've always thought was actually one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in mathematics, okay, is that despite the fact that floors are seemingly ugly functions, okay, and despite the fact that irrational numbers are frankly irrational, okay, that in fact, if you take the BD sequence for alpha and beta defined by the property that 1 over alpha plus 1 over beta equals 1. Any two irrational numbers, okay, where 1 over alpha plus 1 over beta is equal to 1, this property is going to hold. Okay? Why do I say two irrational numbers? Let's first think what this means exactly. If we have two irrational numbers, or an irrational, two numbers A and B, such that 1 over A plus 1 over B is uh, equal to 1, is it possible that a is um, less than one? Okay, one over zero, one over one half is going to be two. Okay, so so long as these things are positive, okay, and the sequences don't make much sense if they're negative. This constraint, one over alpha plus one over beta equals one, okay, enforces that both a and b are greater than one, right? If it was less than one then you would certainly have an integer repeat in a BD sequence, right? If this was, let's say, let's say it was a third. If, let's say, alpha was a third. One-third times one, the floor of that is zero. Two-thirds, one-third times two, the floor of that is zero. The fact that the alpha is and beta are both greater than one, okay, means that we're never going to have a repetition within a sequence, okay? So that, I think, is pretty obvious, okay? But what's interesting here is that um, if you have two irrational numbers, okay, defined like this, okay, my claim is that um, the BD sequences will together decompose the integers. Okay. First claim is to note that um, that that this is important for irrational beta, alpha and beta. Can anybody come up with a pair of rational a and b for which the two sequences do share elements. Okay, suppose let's say alpha and beta were at rationals. Okay, come up with a couple with a rational A and rational B, such that it satisfies this that they would share elements. Okay, well certainly one half and one half. Okay, so if alpha and beta were both two, that would satisfy this thing, but they would share elements. Okay. My claim is that any rational, two pair of rational numbers will eventually share some kind of element. Why is that? Well, let's think about this thing. Suppose we have some rational number, x times y, xy times i, and we have some other one, wz times i, okay? Is there, in fact, some number for which these things are both going to be the same? My claim, I think, is that for i equals, um, just think about this thing. Is there some 
number, who, if we have take the two BD sequences like this, so this is going to be the floor of x, y times 1, plus, and the next one is the floor of 2xy, dot, 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 and this was going to be the floor of wz, floor of 2w over z. If these things are two rash, are, are rationals, okay, so everything here is an integer, is there some number that's going to be in the same, in between these sequences? Okay. Can anybody come up with a number that's going to lie within these sequences? Okay. I claim that, um, actually I should probably have a, a tighter proof of this, I think I'm not coming up with it on, on the fly. Okay. But what's happening here is that this is going to be, okay, let's just think, under what condition would Suppose let's say that we had i was equal to, to let's say i was equal to here, was equal to w times y. Okay? If i was equal to w times y, what's the floor of x times w times y? Well, these are going to be integers, right? So that's an integer. I should, okay? What if I now take this at the integer x, z? Okay, this is going to be w times x times x, y, z. Right? Actually, wait, okay, well, what's, 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 what's wrong? Okay, well, you say what I had before was fine. Let me just double check this thing. So I multiplied uh, this times this. This was going to leave me with double x, w. Right, and here if I multiply, it said i equal to xz, this is going to be equal to um, wx, which is the same thing. So for any two rational numbers, somewhere in their BD sequences, there will be a number that repeats. Okay? How many people believe that I've just proven that? Okay? Most people. Or some people don't believe that I've proven that. Okay? This may be the most interesting thing you learn all semester, so I urge you to to make sure you get that, okay? What I think I've just shown is that if you have any two rational numbers, by taking the multiplying them by the appropriate integer, I can get their different integers, different indices, some number will appear in the two BD sequences together, okay? So if we take a look at rational numbers, just so you're sort of more amazed by this theorem, okay? To have no integer appear in both sequences could not happen for any two rational numbers. Even that part, okay, is amazing, okay, for irrationals. The interesting thing is that for ir irrational numbers, okay, um, any two irrational numbers that satisfy this expression, I claim that their BD sequences, okay, partition the integers. Let me give, try to give the proof in the next few minutes, okay? What is going to be the, how are we going to prove this? For any questions about what this theorem is? How many people think they understand what the theorem means now? Okay, most people, okay? Why is this true? Well, let's count the number of members of each B, uh, BD sequence less than or equal to some integer n, okay? Let's say that n sub phi, alpha sub n, are the number of integers in the BD sequence of alpha that are less than n. Okay? What does that mean? That means that's the set of the number of integers k, such that k is greater than 0, and k times alpha is less than, the floor of k times alpha is less than or equal to n. Okay? This I claim is. Okay, the same, we can get rid of the, if this, since this is an integer, we could get rid of the, um, you know, equality by saying that this is strictly less than um, n plus 1, okay, okay, because this is, you know, this is, this is, okay, if this is true, this is true, it's identical conditions. Once we have now, this is an integer less than n minus 1, that's the same as, um, this is going to be true, the floor of it, okay, this is going to be true, okay, why is this? We know that if we have an integer less than an integer, 
the floor of something less than the integer, we could reduce that thing to um, the, just the contents itself has to be less than that integer. Okay? Now what are we talking about here? Okay? This now says that we know that k alpha, okay, we now want to sum up. This is going to be an Iversonian term. We want to know how many integers k are there, such that k times alpha is less than um, k greater than 0, such that um, k alpha is less than n. That's the same as saying, let's sum up how many integers there are k, such that k is greater than 0, and that k is less than n plus 1 over alpha. Okay, this is simply a question of multiplying both sides, dividing out the k's. Okay, dividing out the alphas. Well, how many integers are there that lie between 0 and um, this? Well, this is an open interval because it doesn't include 0. n plus 1 over, um, al over phi. Is that going to in ever include plus plus alpha? Is this ever going to include that last term? Okay, is n plus one ever over alpha ever going to be an integer k? Well, no, because we're not including it. It's an open interval, and this is an irrational thing anyway. So we can count how many integers there are in this interval because it's an open a, 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 a two-way open interval, and that's how many integers there are in that BD sequence. Okay. Any questions about that? We've shown that for any given n and any given alpha, there are this many integers in its BD sequence less than that, less than or equal to n. Okay? To look on the other side, what do we see? Well, if we want to prove that, in fact, the sequence, BD sequence of alpha and the BD sequence of alpha over alpha minus 1, that together that those partition the integers, what do you have to show? Suppose we show that the number of integers in the BD sequence of the first one plus the number of, BD sequence, the number of integers in the first one BD sequence less than or equal to n, and the number of integers in the second one BD sequence less than or equal to n. Suppose that for all values of n, this is, in fact, equal to n. What does that mean? If we, how many integers are there less than or equal to n? The answer is n. OK? This says how many there are in BD sequence A. This says how many there are in BD sequence B. If together there's always n of them, that meant that there could never have been one that was in 2, OK? or one that was not in 1, because for that particular value of n, the balance would not work. OK? Any questions about the, how people believe this logic? OK? How people don't see the logic? OK? A couple people. OK? Suppose I want to show how many integers there are less than or equal to n. OK? That's this side. If I want to show that for any given value, suppose I want to prove that, 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 that every integer appears in either one sequence or the other. Suppose I could show for n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, dot, 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 for every value of n, that in fact the number of integers in the left sequence and the number of integers in the right sequence is exactly equal to, the number of integers in the left less than n equal n, number of integers on the right sequence less than or equal n, Together, there are as many of them as there are integers less than or equal to n. Okay? You know that, um, that, that, that if this is true for all n, it was true for n equals 1, it was true for n equals 2. If there was a, an integer that was not in that sequence, let's say the integer 5 was not in one, either of these sequences, the number of integers in the sequence less than or equal to 4 on both of them would be would, would add up to be 4. But for the value of 5, this would not hold. Because if the number of integers less, the number of integers, if, if 5 was not in either sequence, okay, then 5 was, um, then the number of integers 
Less than or equal to 5 was the same as the number of integers less than or equal to 4. Number of integers less than or equal to 4. This side would stay the same as we bumped this one up. Okay? Likewise, if there was an integer that was in both of those sequences, the counts matched for n minus 1 for, any, for actual n, if it got added to both sides, this side was now going to be one side greater than that. Okay? So testing this condition is in fact identical to proving that the two things are equal, that, that, that the integers are partitioned between them. Okay? So what do we show? Well, let's now work on what this sum actually is. This sum, what is this sum? Well, I first claim that the um, that that um, because we have an irrational number, okay, neither of these, okay, n over plus one over alpha or this thing over alpha, neither of them are going to be integers, okay. So we know that inside here, there's never going to be an integer value for any n and for any alpha, okay, because alpha is irrational. Okay, so what do we now know? If in fact we take the ceiling of a real number, minus one, okay, the ceiling rounded it up over the floor, okay, strictly moved it up, so the ceiling minus one is the same as the floor. Ceiling minus one is the same as the floor, okay? We can write the floor of something as the real part minus the fractional part. Real part minus the fractional part. Well, the real parts, okay, n plus 1 times 1 over alpha plus alpha minus 1 over alpha, well, that's simply going to be n plus 1 times 1. The fractional parts, what do we have here? The fractional part of n plus 1 over alpha, the fractional part of n plus 1 over this thing. These fractional parts, okay, this is going to be 1 over alpha. This is going to be alpha minus, alpha minus 1 over alpha. These sum up to be 1. Okay? And if you believe that, then n plus 1 minus 1 is n for any value of n. Okay? And so therefore, these things did partition the integers. Any questions about that? Okay? Look at the proof carefully, because this is an amazing thing. Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, I'll make up for it by not having class on Thursday. Okay, and uh, pick up the homeworks. I'll see you guys then. Thanks a lot. Bye.